Welcome everybody to this online lecture, which is given with the light board, which you see in front of me. Actually, you don't see it yet, but you will see it in a moment, because I hope you can see what I write. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. So this talk will be on moduli spaces, but on a very elementary level. It's an introductory talk for non-experts in the field. But I see in the audience there are many people who know much better than I do this topic, so please apologize for any inaccuracies. I want to keep it at a low level, but try to show you some of the main ideas and also a new approach using phylogenetic trees in order to put to enrich a little bit uh, this story. Okay, so our topic will be moduli. So my pens are not perfect, but I hope that you can read. This is what I'm writing. And in the first section, let me just phrase what is the problem. We take the projective line, P1 here, I draw it real, and we choose some points on it. So these will be endpoints. And when you think of the complex numbers, then you would draw this like this. Of course, you have to compactify. I'm not going to do this. And then you might want to draw them like this. And then you would call this maybe an n-gon. Okay. And uh, so this again, this would be p1r, and here you have p1c. Okay. If you cannot hear me well, or if you don't see precisely what I write, please give me a sign. Okay. Also, as you see, this light board which we have is a funny story because I'm I'm looking to the camera and at the same time I'm writing on the on the piece of glass which is in between. Okay, and then of course the picture is reflected. I'm not writing a reflected way. I am not able to do this. Okay, so <clears throat> what we what this is of course a very classical topic and uh, we will repeat what everybody has done already. We let the automorphism group of P1 act on P1 to the n. So these are here the n tuples of points. And we assume that they are pairwise distinct. So I will take out the big diagonal. So I will assume that xi is different for, from x j, so these are called here xi, xi, okay. And this acts, so what is the automorphism group of p1? That's pgl2 over the field. You can do it over any field, but we will draw our pictures over the reals. And it acts, so if you take here matrix A, it acts by Möbius transformations, so A times z, if this is A, B, C, D, will be as usual A, Z plus B, C, Z plus D. Möbius transformation. Okay. And the, the first question you can ask is, what would be the space of orbits? Okay, so you could call this p1 to the n minus delta mod pgl2. So let's start a little bit to do this. We start with n equals 1. That's not interesting. We have just one point. And it is clear that we can move it wherever we want because the action is transitive, so we can move it to the point 0 in P1. So I identify this often with k union infinity. OK, k is our ground field. So that's not very exciting. So PGL2 is three-dimensional. Think over the complex numbers or over the real numbers. Okay. So n equals 2, two distinct points.
with the action. So this 0 is, of course, a representative of the orbit. And here, if we have a pair of points, we can move it to 0, 1 in p1, 2. And that's a nice representative of the orbits. So again, we just get one point as the space of orbits. And for n equals 3, the same story. It's easy to see that PGL2 acts 3 transitively on p1 to the n. Uh, and so we get a normal form 0, 1, infinity in p1 to 3. So each time we just get nothing interesting, just a point as our moduli space. Things become interesting when we go to n equals 4. For n equals 4, so we can, of course, the first three points will go to 0, 1, infinity. But the fourth point will be some point A, and we cannot move it wherever we want. Okay, So <clears throat> the, the key observation here is maybe I don't write down here because you cannot read it. So I'm very limited with my black board, which is a light board. So I have to spare space whenever I can. Okay, So when we have four points, we have the famous cross ratio. I guess that my pen is running out of, of life. Let me try with this one. The cross ratio z1, z2, z3, z4 of four points. Let me recall z1 minus z3 z2 minus z4. This one also doesn't work. I hope this one is better. Sorry for this technical problem. We are still fighting with it, but it's not so obvious how to do it. Z3. And the observation is that whenever you take PGL2 acting, the cross ratio is preserved. Is Preserved. Now I'm almost through all my pens. Preserved. I think this one is better by the action of PGL2. So when you move here this point 0, 1, infinity A by the action of PGL2, the cross ratio will stay the same. And actually, uh, it's a theorem that the cross ratio is the only invariant up to generation. So, and that's essentially the only invariant. Any other one is a function in the cross ratio. Okay. So now here for n equals four. Our moduli space or classifying space or space of orbits will be, so we, we move the first three points to 0, 1 at infinity. And then A will be a point outside these three points. So we get P1 minus 0, 1, and infinity. And here's the A. And the position of A is uniquely given by the cross ratio. Okay. So we see that this is uh, quasi-affine or quasi-projective. It's not compact yet. Okay? And one big business in the theory of moduli is to compactify moduli spaces. Okay? So this cross ratio here, whenever we assume that the points are pairwise distinct, so z1, z2, z3, z4, pairwise distinct, then it takes a value in 0 in p1 except 0, 1, and infinity. And whenever it equals 0, 1, or infinity, two of these must be equal. And you can detect from the values 0, 1, and infinity here which ones are equal. Okay, So uh, Doing this, we now get, in general, if we take now n points, 
we take out the big diagonal. We take it mod PGL2. We could see this as P1 minus these special values. And then as the first three are fixed, we get n minus 3. Okay. This is something one may want to call M0n, following Mumford, Delin, and Knudsen. Okay. So the interesting story begins when you ask yourself, what happens if some of these points come together? Okay. So here you have four points, and you allow that they move. Okay. Here, these two may come closer. Yeah? So this corresponds to compactify this space here. So the question is limits as points come together. This is one way to formulate it. And the other one is uh, compactification of M0n. And I want to discuss this uh, kind of taking limits with you. Okay. Now, there's always a short break because I have to clean the blackboard. And that's a little bit more complicated than on the usual blackboard because I'm kind of as in the garage where you wash your car. <clears throat> but. So the, the students of my class are already used to this cleaning process. And then we have a kind of vacuum cleaner. Any questions so far? Everything fine? So let me <coughs> write this again. Limits of n tuples in P1. So now you have your endpoints here, and they start to move. I will show you at the end, after what I show you a movie, how, how they can move under the action of PGL2. They move in a certain pattern. But then as you take a family of such points, they may come together. So there might be two points which come together very fast, and there might be a third point which also comes to the same position, but it comes slowlier. So you want to measure this in your limits. It depends how many limits do you want to add to your M0n to get a nice, compact, compact symmetric space. Okay? And that's not completely obvious how to handle it. And I think it was the idea of Delin and Nomford. They had the, the following concept of taking limits. You don't only move the points, but you move also P1. Yeah? So you consider P1 as a family of curves, rational curves, isomorphic to P1. But in the limit, you allow degenerations. So let me draw my P1. I draw just real pictures. You could draw it like this, your p1. But you could also, of course, draw it as a hyperbola. And on this p1, you have your points. Of course, my picture is cheating because it's a real picture, but you know what I'm doing. 
you think of it as a hyperbola, and then in the limit, so the limit, maybe I can draw this as it moves. Now the, it may become sharper, or hyperbola. And in the limit, you might get something like this. So this was the original hyperbola. And the limit will be a union of axes. Okay. So that's very, very simple. But at the same time, it is a, a big idea. And I want to tell you why. Because if you now take, let's say, three points below here, okay, then in the limit, they will end up possibly at different components. Okay. Now, being on different components will mean that if you now take this horizontal axis, then you get here the projection of these two points below here. And this corresponds that these two points here have come together on this horizontal line. Okay. So it's a kind of bookkeeping. Bookkeeping on limits. Okay. So again, you don't only move the points, but you think of your P1 as a family of curves. The generic fiber will be just an irreducible rational curve. But the special fiber could have various components, each of them being a P1. Okay. So this limit configuration is what is called a stable curve. Okay, So let me write this down. And I do it already with points. An end-pointed stable curve. And I'm only doing genus 0 is a union of P1s. Of course, the, the generic case would be just one P1. But in the, as I said, the special fiber could be several P1s meeting transversally. with n marked points on them. And so I will draw a picture in a moment. The n marked points are not allowed to sit in the intersection of two components with n marked points on them, such that each component has at least three special points. So what is a special point? Either intersection point or marked. So let me draw one such. I'm now drawing one with several components. So we, here we have five P1s. And in order to have three special points, we have to add here one. That's the intersection point is never a marked point. Okay. On this one, we don't need anything. On this one, we need at least one point. And here we have two points. Okay. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, n equals seven. So this is such a stable curve with endpoints. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever you have such a picture, you are interested in looking at the dual graph. So I suppose you know what the dual graph is. For every component, you draw a point, which is a vertex of the graph. And whenever two components intersect, you connect them by an edge. So here we have one, two, three, four, five five components. So let me call them one, 
two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So one is connected to two. Two is connected to three. Three is connected to four and five. OK? So these are just the, the incidence graph or the dual graph of the figure without the points. Now we add the points. I add them in blue. So curve 1, component 1 has two points on them, and I draw them as leaves. Okay. The red dots will be the inner vertices of our dual graph. Number two has just one marked points. Number three has no at all. And four and five have two leaves. Okay. So that's the dual graph. You have <coughs> probably seen this picture already of our stable curve. Now, those who have read the abstract to this talk, they have already seen the word phylogenetic tree, and this is a phylogenetic tree. I will come back to it a little bit later. OK, so maybe I can still write here, so not to have to erase too much. Uh, this is one concept of De, of De Lynn Mumford to consider these degenerations, if you want, of P1s as a stable curve. The other thing is, in the spirit of Grotendieck, to look at our objects always in families. Okay? So this was an, a, one single stable curve, but you can also look at, at families of stable curves. So this will be an important concept which was essentially uh, promoted by Grotendieck to look at objects and objects varying in a continuous family. So we take a morphism, let me call it pi, from x to s. s is some base space. And the fibers xs are stable curves. OK? So, the, the space of stable curves does not carry a natural topology. Nevertheless, whenever you study moduli problems, you want to, to have your moduli space respect objects which are very close to each other. Now, if two stable curves are very similar to each other, you want to have the representatives in the moduli space very close to each other. Now, the, the replacement for the non-existing topology is looking at fibers of morphisms. No? If you have a flat morphism, you know that the fibers behave in a somewhat continuous way. Okay? Now, in order to have all of the marked points, you need here n sections, n disjoint sections. And then you will really get a kind of continuous family of endpointed stable curves. And the big theorem of, I think I can, err, maybe I keep this picture here and I erase here. The theorem of Delin, Mumford, and Knudsen is that the space, the modular space of stable curves is a nice compactification of the moduli space of n pairwise distinct points. Okay. That's a, these are very prominent papers. So let me just sketch the theorem. M0, 
n bar is endpointed stable curves modulo our equivalence relation. You have a notion of isomorphism between endpointed stable curves. Okay. And the theorem is that this is a smooth, irreducible, projective variety or scheme, if you want, or you can look at it as stacks. I'm not going to discuss this <coughs> of dimension n minus 3 and the moduli space. So I'm not going to define here in detail what the moduli space is. I just give you two properties. Any, if we have such a family, any family of stable curves corresponds. So whenever you have your family, you have the fibers xs, s in s. Okay, I don't draw the sections here. So each of these fibers, you can take the equivalence class up to isomorphism of this stable curve. Okay, and then you will get an an element inside this moduli space. Okay? And the claim is that sending a point s in s to the equivalence class of xs represented by a point in the moduli space, that this is a morphism of algebraic varieties, corresponds to a morphism from s to m 0 n bar. So this is the best what you can hope for. And this is one statement. And the second statement is that when you go up to n plus 1, m0 n plus 1 bar, m0 n bar, so what is this, this map? This map is just forgetting the n plus first point. Okay, When you delete this n plus first point, you get a natural map down to m0 n bar. And this is what is called is a universal family, which means the following, that any family x to s, as you have above here, is, so here you have this map. Let me call it alpha. Now this one, let me call it alpha. Let me call it alpha tilde. And then you get, here you get the pullback. You make the Cartesian square by taking the fiber product. And here you get x. OK, so any family of endpoint and stable curves is given by pullback of the universal family. OK, so there are various proofs of this, these results in various papers. And Dylan Mumford and Aldo Knudsen is not easy to read. Yeah, you need quite a bit of machinery from algebraic geometry. And what I want to propose today in the second half of this lecture is to give you an approach which is kind of down to earth, relatively elementary, and moreover, we think it is quite exciting and beautiful. Okay. So this is the second part is a cooperation with Josef Schicho and Yayue Ki. Okay. So let me erase this here. As you see, sometimes some clouds remain, and then I have to clean again. So
So maybe I, I think I should also give credits to Michael Eichmeier. Michael Eichmeier is a colleague here at the University of Vienna in differential geometry. And he invented or created this light board uh, during the pandemic in order to have classes where you can talk to the audience online and still uh, draw on the light board. Okay? So it's a, a new feature. I think it's quite nice. It's not perfect yet. The light board is maybe too small. Cleaning is also a little bit complicated, but I hope that you get a that you get something from the from the lecture. Okay. So let me let me continue. So uh, an alternative approach. So the construction of this complicated modular space is quite difficult. Okay? So we will propose another construction which is equivalent to this one, but which is actually which fits on this, pay, on this uh, light board here. So let me, I need a little bit of notation. Let me call un equal p1 to the n minus the big diagonal. So these are pairwise distinct entaples in p1. And uh, we take as before, m0 n, we take un mod pgl2. <clears throat> which would be just the modular space. So without limits, that's not so exciting yet. And uh, now we do the following. Uh, the idea is to choose an embedding of UN in a huge projective space embed un or mn, m0n, into large projective space. So once you embed, you look at the image, and then you just take the Zariski closure of this image. Then take the Zariski closure. of image, and surprise, what you get is m0 n bar. You get something isomorphic to m0 n bar. So you only have to give this embedding, and you're done. Okay. So this, par this embedding partially appears in papers of Gerritsen, uh, Herrlich, and van der Putt. But uh, they don't pursue completely this approach. So I guess that I will be short in time, but I don't want to hurry. If I don't cover everything, it's not a problem. I want to go slowly because I think it's really nice. So how do we embed? So an, a point here is just an n-tuple, x1 up to xn, xi in p1. Okay, And I already said that any three components, x1, x2, x3, or any other three, with the action of PGL2, they can be moved to 0, 1, and infinity. And we do this for any triples of indices. So let me write n for the set 1 up to n. And let me write n over 3 i, j, k triples. So and I will call these t. So when we have x in un, 
we can associate to it something which will depend on t. t is such a triple. And what is the condition? It is in the same orbit as x, yeah? same orbit as x. But y, so y, t is now i, j, k. y, t, i will be 0. y, t, j will be 1. And y, t, k will be infinity. This can be done for any t. So we, the embedding of un into, now this will be p1 to n over 3, sending x. Now we take t in n over 3. These are just the, this notation is just the triples in this set n. And we send them to yt. So for each triple, we move our n tuple x to an n tuple where the chosen indices i, j, k have entries which are the values 0, 1, and infinity. That's all. So that's completely uh, clear cut what we are doing. Here we have a big space. We don't care. Okay. And this is an embedding. And it is clear that this respects orbit. So if we go here to m0n, if we take the orbits under PGL2, we get an embedding here. Let Vn be the image. And Xn, the Zariski closure of Vn. And we are done. That's already our object we want to study. Okay? And in the course, not today, but in the, in the course I'm giving uh, online, we prove completely that Xn has all the properties you expect, and actually that it is isomorphic to M0n bar. Okay? So that's a very elegant definition. We also have a We also have a second uh, variety, projective variety, which we call yn. And I will denote it like this. Now, the objects inside here in this p1 to the n to the 3, I will call them strings. And I will denote them by bold phase x. So this will be x t, t in n over 3. Okay. And uh, the condition is always, uh, as we have it here for this 0, 1, and infinity. I don't write it down because that takes too much space. And the yn will be the strings such that uh, the orbits, sorry, this was a that the cross ratio of excuse me i have to i have to dry so maybe i should be a little bit slower here here we just take the risky closure recall that we have these yt's many yt's and each yt is an n tuple Okay. As it is coming from the same x, the cross ratios of yt will be the same as the cross ratios of ys, yeah? because it always corresponds to the same orbit. Okay. And the cross ratio is defined by choosing four of the entries of yt. Okay. So now we take the strings. These are x, t, t in n over 3. And the condition is the cross ratio of xt. And here we take any quadruple of indices, okay, i, j, k, l. This should be the same as cross q xs for all st in n over 3 and for all quadruples in n over 4. Recall that the cross ratio is defined 
for four points. Yeah? And our quadruple will select four entries of each yt, and then we compare. OK? So it is clear by what I said before that we have this inclusion. And as you expect, one proves that these are equal. Okay? But this comes at the very end. And before going there, we will have an excursion to phylogenetic trees. So we have already defined our object. And then our xn equal to yn. So let me write this down. Claim or theorem xn equal yn isomorphic to m0 n bar. OK? So not only this, but we will prove directly that xn has the properties I mentioned in the theorem of Knudsen, Mumford, and Dillin. And xn has the required properties. So this first it proves that it has the required properties, and then it follows that it is isomorphic to the compactification. Okay. <clears throat> so to give you a little bit of flavor how these limits are taken. Let me take the following example. We take a 5 gon, n equals 5. We take 0. I start from the very beginning, so t will be 1, 2, 3. And then we have two more components, a, b. a, b are different in p1 outside 0, 1, infinity. So to give you a feeling how these limits work. So where can this go? What can happen? Only a and b are allowed to move. 0, 1, and infinity are fixed. So the first thing which can happen is that a and b approach each other. So this could go to 0, 1, infinity, a, a. It could also happen that b stays and a approaches one of these. So you would have 0, 1 infinity infinity and b different from 0 1 infinity and you may also have that a b coalesce but are equal to infinity in the limit so 0 1 infinity infinity okay so you see even if you start with a simple five gone you don't just add one limit you will add many limits yeah? And this is a question of not only of taste, but of the properties of the object of the compactification you construct. So a remark, and then we come to the first construction. Take n equals 4. Now we take. Zero. Now these are four tuples, and the t would be two, three, four. Two, three, four. And we could also look at da da dum, zero, one, infinity, infinity. T equals one, two, three. Okay, the triple. Now these two are not equivalent by BGL2. Yeah? But they have the same cross ratio. Same cross ratio. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that when you go to this risky closure, you add many points, which now have always the same cross ratio as we said before, but the orbits might be different. Okay. That's the that's the point here. So in this situation,
one will codify, we will codify these limits by what is called incidence pattern. So we will associate a graph to a string x in this capital Xn. So how does this go? So let x be in xn a string. So recall, this is a collection of n tuples, t in n over 3, xt in p1 to the n. We will define an incidence graph in the following way. So this is a graph, a finite graph as from, from graph theory. So the inner vertices, let me call it gamma bold physics, the inner vertices. So here we have many n tuples, and I said the orbits of the n tuples could be different. The cross ratios are the same. So the inner vertices will be the set of all orbits of the xt's orbits. So it could be that xt and xs have the same orbit or not. Yeah? You get a collection of orbits. The edges between these inner vertices <coughs> are the following. Uh, let me write it down and then I'll explain. So xt, the orbit of xt is connected to xs if and only if xt and xs have complementary incidence sets. So what does this mean? When you have xt, which is xt1 up to xtn, you get a partition of this set capital at the end, the set of indices. And how does it go? I don't write it down. The sets of the partition are just those indices where the entries are the same, same entries. Here, you would have, in this example, you would have here 3 and 4 as one set, and then 1, 1 set, 2, and 5. And here you would have a partition with three sets, namely the set consisting of 1, the set consisting of 2, and the set consisting of 3, 4, 5. Okay? And whenever these are complementary, you connect them by an edge. Okay? Then... <coughs> The, you add all the leaves, which are kind of outer vertices. So these are the singletons of xt. So what are the singletons? The singletons are those indices such that xti is different from all others. So singletons i, xti, different xtj for all j non-i. Okay. These will be the leaves. And then you attach the leaves to all those vertices by an edge where it is a singleton. Okay. So you get connect leaves by what is called legs. I will give you two examples in a minute so you see what's going on. How am I running with time? Uh, 
Oh, I just have 10 minutes left. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe I take five minutes more. If Johannes permits, we will see. Let me draw some examples to give you a feeling what is going on. We take n equals 5, and I just take two. Let's assume we just have two orbits. The, one, the first one is 0, 1, infinity, infinity, infinity. And v is another one, xs. So it is 0, 0, 1, infinity, and a. And a is distinct from the others. So we have two orbits in x. And a is different, 0, 1, infinity. So what do we get? We have two vertices, u and v. They are connected because here we have the set 3, 4, 5 as an incident set. And here it is 1, 2, the incident set. You see? So they are complementary. And you connect them. And how many singletons do you have? u, u has 1 and 2 as singletons. 1 and 2. These are the indices. And v, we will have three singletons, namely three, four, five. That's the graph. Okay. Let's go to the second example, n equals 7. So now I will abbreviate a little bit in order to write less. We take 0, 1, and now I just write dots for infinity, so five dots here, v equals 0, 0, 1, infinity, infinity, infinity. Then we take w equals 0, 0, 1, 1, infinity, and infinity. And finally, z equals 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, infinity. So that's a dot. Okay, let me draw the incidence graph. So now you have to be a little bit careful to see what are the complementary things. And you get the following u is connected to v. Then it is connected to w. You check it immediately. So I have a, a z prime, which I did not write down. Oh, that's not good. Which is similar, but a little bit different. I don't have it here. Sorry. So this one will be connected to z, but I want to have all the z prime here. Okay, you can construct it yourself. And now we draw the leaves. The leaves are the singletons. So you will have two leaves, one and two. We will just have one singleton. The unique singleton of B is one. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's number three. Index number three. Here we will have two, and by sim that's symmetric, we will have four, five, six, seven. Okay. That's the incidence graph of our string. We have. Here we have five vertices. Do you remember this picture? You have seen this picture today already. This was a dual graph of a stable curve. And it pops up here again by a completely different construction. And it is precisely the same as we had before. Okay. So this should be related in some sense to dual graphs of stable curves. Dual graphs of n pointed stable curves. 
And of course, this is not a coincidence. That's a theorem. <coughs> The incidence graph of a string x, as defined before, is a phylogenetic tree. So what is a phylogenetic tree? I did not know. I mean, I've heard about phylogenetic trees, but I always thought that's something for people doing biology. And I thought that maybe mathematically not so interesting. But actually, it's a very nice concept. It's very simple to define. So let me write this down, theorem. And that's in our cooperation with Joseph Schicho and Tsai The incidence graph of any string x in xn equals yn is a phylogenetic tree. So what is this? A finite planar tree without loops and without vertices of valence degree 2. So you see here, the inner vertices, the blue ones, they have a degree at least 3, and the leaves are those which have degree 1. These are the outer vertices. Okay. So this is uh, one funny thing, for instance, is that the singletons are always attached to a single inner vertex. That's not obvious a priori. You have to prove it. Okay? You see that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are distributed over the whole graph. You'd never have one connected to two inner vertices. Okay? And you also have a converse to this theorem, which says that all phylogenetic tree are incidence graphs of strings in Xn. So let me just and all phylogenetic trees arise in this way. So you see that a, a bunch of combinatorics is entering the scene. And the combinatorics is you have it here on your table, and you can work with it. Okay. So I have one more minute. That's not sufficient, but you give me two more minutes, and then I am done. So the theorem is now using the basic theory and operations with phylogenetic trees, you prove everything what Delin, Mumford, and Knudsen have proven by showing it for xn. So xn equals yn irreducible smooth projective dimension. I just repeat the theorem. <coughs> Second, if you take xn minus this vn, which was xn is the heuristic closure of y, and this is what is called the boundary divisor, boundary divisor with normal crossings, that's also one of the results in the theory, then 3xn is a fine moduli space <coughs> of strings in P1 to the n, um, no, of n, tup uh, n tuples. I don't want to be. Don't blame me on this. I just give you an idea and not the details. Okay? Then we get, again, we get a projection map. Now it goes from xn plus 1 to xn, forgetting the nth entries, the n plus first entries, sorry, 
and those first entries. Now you have your strings, and in each string, which is now in xn plus 1, it has n plus 1 entries, okay, each uh, n plus 1 gone, and you delete the last one. And this will be the universal family. Now, you can also recover the concept of stable curve. Let me call this tau. The fibers of tau are stable curves. And if you define natural sections, then you get uh, them even endpointed. So you see, I think that's a, a very nice aspect. You have, if you don't know anything about stable curves, and if you just do this, it's not a kindergarten construction, but it is a very simple construction. And if you look at this projection map, the concept of stable curve pops up automatically. Yeah? You recover the definition of the linear Mumford by a completely different construction. And number six, I hope that you can still read it, yes. By all this, it follows that this is isomorphic to the delin mumford knudsen compactification of the moduli space of endpoints on curves of t naught zero. Thank you very much, and any questions, you're welcome. I don't hear anything. I think I have a question, actually two. Yeah. And namely, um, in the, in the, okay, the first, the first question is in the beginning, um, you wrote down this, this explicit um, sort of schematic picture of some V1s intersecting and then some mark points on it. Yes. At least, uh, at least three. Yeah, so, but now if, if they are precisely three, yes. is then um, the curve, the, the stable curve, already determined by its graph? Uh, I think so. Because if they are more, yeah. then certainly not, because yes. you have these cross ratios, but yeah. if they are precisely? Yes, so this corresponds to in the, the dual graph is then what is called an extremal graph, and that's... Uh, that's actually the uh, you have on the on your xn or m0 n bar you get a natural stratification by the phylogenetic trees okay so the the big open stratum will correspond to the generic tree the generic tree is not so interesting it just has n leaves and one inner vertex okay that will correspond to un or to vn. And what you see, the other one is uh, the opposite. It is what you are saying is that you just have the minimal number of leaves which are necessary to have a phylogenetic tree. So here you have always one. Here you have nothing because you have already degree 3. Here you need two, here you need nothing, and here you have two. Okay? And these are, these are graphs which correspond to the smallest strata of your stratification, and these smallest strata are points. So they are fixed okay, by, the, by the graph. Okay? okay. Yes, you have to con you have to contract in a minimal way so that you still get a stable n, point, n minus one stable curve. That's also happening here. Yeah, in this projection map here, whenever you delete 
a leaf which destroys the property of being a phylogenetic tree, you have to contract. Okay? I don't explain the details, but it's a simple procedure. Okay? Discussion of when we have to contract uh, the phylogenetic tree in order to, so when we have to contract in order to satisfy the condition that we still have a phylogenetic tree. Um, is there any characterization of this property, or is it just uh, uh, so can we just define it and then uh, check directly whether this is satisfied or not? Yeah, so that's something I skipped on page five of my manuscript the operations you allow with phylogenetic trees. So what you can do is you can contract, and you have a certain, let's say, axioms how to do this. You can also extend. You are allowed to add leaves and also to, to add edges in a precise way. And you can also cut. You can cut in between by deleting. By le you don't see it, sorry. You are allowed to delete one edge, and then you get two graphs. And this gives you a Cartesian product structure of your xn. Okay? So there is a kind of dictionary how to do this, but that will come in the course during this fall. Okay? okay So on the curve, I don't want to comment it, but I can comment it on the strings. And on the strings, it means that you take limits of strings. So in your stratification, these are locally closed subsets of Xn. Each strata is a locally closed subset. And in the, the boundary of each stratum is a union of strata. And the contraction of the tree corresponds to going from one of these smaller strata to the big adjacent stratum. Okay? So the topology, the topology of your stratification is reflected in the operations of the tree. Okay? There's a complete going back and forth telling you how to proceed. Huh? I'm not going to explain how you do it, because this would take too much time, but it's not difficult. Okay? No, it has, it's not in this way. No, no, no. It's a, it's a completely different dictionary because, uh, I mean, varieties and ideals, that's kind of uh, inclusion reversing one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. But here it's, it's more subtle, no? Because on the one side you have the geometry of the strings, and you just have the combinatorial objects of the graphs of the phylogenetic trees. Yeah? So it's not one-to-one, -one, but these objects here codify very important or very crucial information about the strings. No? OK, so thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Thank I'm happy to, to give the talk. And uh, there's an automatic recording. And it, I, can, I will send you the, actually, it's on the link of the website, which you already know, where the recording will be uh, available. Okay. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, see you another time. Bye-bye.